Good evening. Welcome to California Today. I'm Lian Zhang. Here's a preview of some of today's stories. A woman running for the state's attorney general seat says there is a big problem with how prisoners are handled. She spoke against an early release program that can reduce some sentences by two thirds in length. A recent report said the state's energy saving programs often don't result in less energy consumption. We'll share what phenomena ends up causing that. And a city in Los Angeles County held its seventh free catalytic converter engraving program. The program comes with the rampant theft of the expensive car part and the head of a state bill that offers similar services. April 24th to the 30th is National Crime Victims Rights Week. That's brought the California's early release program to the center of debate. NTD Cynthia Kai has a special report with the Sacramento District Attorney to hear more about the cause behind the rise in violent crime. California has seen a rise in violent crime in recent months. Just this month, a shooting at the state capitol took the lives of six people and injured 12 others. Sacramento's District Attorney Anne Marie Schubert says the rise in violent crime is a result of poor criminal policies. We've got this bad combination of, of kind of flooding our communities with releases. You've got inadequate supervision. You've got inadequate um, plans for them, inadequate rehabilitation. Then you've got good legislators like Assemblymember Jim Cooper, who's trying to pass a bill that would just put a GPS device on a high-risk parolee, and our legislature saying no, that is, um, that is illogical and it's, it's not good for public safety. The April 3rd Sacramento shooting resulted from an unspecified gang dispute that led to gunfire in downtown Sacramento. An investigation later found that some suspects were repeat felons who were released from prison just weeks before the incident. We can never forget the human toll of crime, okay, the consequences of crime on people's lives. It changes people's lives, particularly violent crime. It changes how they look, you know, their outlook on life. It changes how they raise their children. It, it changes how perhaps the professions they choose. California's early release program emerged from a 2016 voter-approved proposition. California passed a proposition in um, 2016 called Prop 57, which was allegedly designed to uh, expedite releases through rehabilitation and to allow what we call more credits, meaning you know early releases. So many of us in this profession, pro prosecutors and law enforcement, have been kind of sounding the alarm actually before Prop 57 passed. But Schubert says many DAs believe the idea of early releases hurts public safety, especially if inmates aren't given re-entry plans back to society. And we said, you know, if you just start handing out credits to dangerous people or if you let them actually just easily say, if we're going to let violent people out of prison early without adequate rehabilitation, then we're failing. We're going to fail that. Um, individual for not rehabilitating them, we're going to fail the victims for not holding people accountable, and we're going to only endanger public safety. In January 2022, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, or CDCR, enacted an emergency regulation. Inmates can participate in services and programs to increase the credits they earn to reduce their prison sentence. Their reasoning was to limit COVID infections despite low death rates. Now, the CDCR plans to make the accelerated credit system permanent, which can reduce certain prison sentences by up to 67 percent. Proponents of the change say it promotes participation in rehab and educational services, but a handful of district attorneys spoke against the idea at the April 16th public hearing. People that go to prison now in California it took a lot of effort to get there. It's either that they are repeat offenders over and over and over again, or they committed a very particularly violent crime, such as a murder or a sexual assault. So the population in our prison system now are the most dangerous of the most dangerous. Additionally, California released thousands of inmates from state prisons during the pandemic. 
Schubert says the state legislature needs to strengthen criminal laws, allow prosecutors to prosecute criminal offenders, and roll back early release programs. First of all, we need to fund law enforcement to do their jobs. Okay, this this concept of defunding the police has and never will be a good idea. Listen, we can always invest in more prevention programs. That's that's something we should all be willing to do. But we must have a robust law enforcement in California and across this country. Schubert is one of the candidates running for California's attorney general seat. The primary election is on June seventh, and midterm elections are on November eighth. Cynthia Kai, NTD News, California. According to a recent study, most California incentive programs designed to reduce energy use are not effective. In fact, many have the opposite effect. NTD's Eileen Ang gives a look at how that happens. California spends about a billion dollars on programs to encourage energy saving. From light bulbs to solar panels, but a study led by the University of California, Los Angeles, found that most of them haven't resulted in any energy savings. Instead, many have actually led to increased energy consumption. UCLA's Stephanie Pinstall, a co-author of the paper, said this is possibly a result of a phenomenon related to technological advancements. Often, when new technology makes something more efficient, the more people use it. The technical term for this is Jevons paradox. Pinstall said people think they can increase consumption without increasing their bills, so they use more. This conclusion comes after researchers analyzed electricity bills of more than 11 million households in Southern California between 2010 to 2015. California aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 40 percent below 1990 levels by 2030. Homes make up about 40 percent of overall emissions in the state's urban areas. The research recommends ways to improve the programs, like making them accessible to older, less energy-efficient buildings. California is cracking down on catalytic converter theft. An assemblyman proposed a bill that would ensure the catalytic converter would match the vehicle. One community is already taking action. The California government is looking to stop catalytic converter theft plaguing the state, but some local communities are not waiting around. The City of Industry in Los Angeles held their seventh Etch and Prevent Catalytic Converter Theft Prevention Program on Wednesday. And the purpose of that is to um, prevent、um, a suspect from seeing a catalytic converter and stealing it after、uh, we. Put the license plate on there, or afterwards, if a license plate that is found and we've recovered it, we can trace that、uh, catalytic converter through the license plate that was etched on that catalytic converter. While many drivers might not know what a catalytic converter is, thieves do. Theft of the car components has increased by over 1,500 percent in some parts of California in just a few years. More people are getting familiar with this obscure part. Which, if stolen, can cost anywhere from one to four thousand dollars to replace.、Um, just wanted to get the car protected because I had neighbors and friends who have had their catalytics actually stolen from their vehicles. So better than to make something so it's deterrent than making it easily just taken in and get it recycled. However, they're doing whatever they're doing with them. That's where the free catalytic etch prevention program comes in. The etch takes only several minutes. Despite the changes, Deputy Huang isn't celebrating yet. I see this is ongoing, based on the precious metals that are inside catalytic converters, and until that changes, the technology of that changes, I think these types of thefts will continue unless we do things like this. As for the state government, Assemblyman Adam Gray introduced Assembly Bill 2682. It aims to reduce theft the same way as what the LA Sheriff's Department is already doing: etching the VIN number on the catalytic converter. It was approved by the Assembly Transportation Committee on Tuesday and is waiting for a vote at the Assembly Public Safety Committee. Imagine you're staying at a hotel and they lose your suitcase containing eight thousand dollars worth of items. Then the hotel pays you only a fraction of that, and that's what happened in California because a loophole in the law. NTD's Arian Pasdar has the details. A California law enacted in 1872 limits a hotel's liability to $1,000. Now many say the law is outdated. That's mostly because $1,000 back then is only worth around $50 today. 
According to ABC, the guest had various items such as laptops and even a hard drive with his social security number and tax returns in the suitcase at the Marriott Marquis in San Francisco. He sued the hotel, won and was awarded $5,000. Later, the hotel appealed on grounds of the law enacted in 1872. The hotel won the appeal and they had to pay the guest only around $1,500. A professor at the University of California, Berkeley, says this law and others should probably be changed. Well, there are all kinds of rules and regulations and laws that were enacted long ago and some even recently. Uh, that perhaps could be usefully and sensibly updated, but legislatures and regulators don't always get around to updating them in a very prompt fashion. According to ABC, a San Francisco Superior Court judge also says the law didn't achieve an equitable outcome in this case. Ariane Pastar, NTD News. We're going to take a short break, but here's a look at what we got for you when we come back. After the southern half of the state mandated limited residential water use, one county refused. We'll look at which one and why. A bill targeting mentally ill and drug addicted homeless people is advancing through the legislature despite concerns. Lawmakers say the bill will address the state's homeless crisis. An exhibit showcasing the life and philosophy of Bruce Lee opens at a museum in the past martial artist's hometown of San Francisco. That and more on California Today. A day after a Southern California water district voted to limit outdoor water usage to once per week, one county said it would not implement the mandate. They say they have spent billions on making their own self-reliant system for handling extra watering. The Orange County Water District, which provides water for over 2.5 million people, will not mandate outdoor water usage to one day a week. Officials made the announcement a day after the neighboring Metropolitan Water District announced an emergency conservation mandate to address drought conditions. According to Steve Sheldon, president of the OC Water District, the agency will not comply because it has a groundwater replenishment system and has spent billions of dollars to be self-reliant. He said mandatory conservation would ultimately cost consumers. It will reduce water sales to water agencies and would require increasing water rates to recover the same amount of revenue needed to operate a water agency. The Metropolitan Agency will begin restricting outdoor water usage June 1st to one day a week. It will limit each consumer to 80 gallons of outdoor water use per day, a significant decrease from the current consumer average of 125 gallons. The mandate will affect about 6 million people. The state has been grappling with homelessness without an effective method implemented. One comparatively extreme measure from the governor is making its way now through legislation. NTD Cynthia Kai has a look at what it would force onto certain individuals. California plans to force some homeless individuals into court-ordered care programs. That's according to a bill that made its way through the Senate Judiciary Committee on April 26th. We have been investing billions and billions and billions of dollars into our mental health system, into our homelessness system. And I'm not saying this will impact homelessness on a broad scale, but this bill, I believe, this legislation, this care court, will help those who are sickest and most desperately need our help. At the beginning of March, Governor Gavin Newsom proposed the Community Assistance Recovery and Empowerment, or CARE, court. Senators Susan Eggman and Tom Umberg introduced the proposal as Senate Bill 1338 for the legislature to vote on. Care Court is for residents and homeless people deemed to be struggling with substance abuse and mental illnesses. These people would receive court-ordered care for up to two years. It is not conservatorship. There is no substitute for the decision maker uh, for that person who may be um, ill. Care court does not create a path to arrest. Care court is, a, is in a civil court, is not a criminal court. It does not allow for forced involuntary medication. Care court participants cannot be forced to participate. Law enforcement will not arrest them if they do not come to court. 
Also speaking at the hearing was California Health and Human Services Agency Secretary Dr. Mark Galley. He said the system would prioritize those with specific conditions, such as schizophrenia and psychotic disorders. While the initiative seeks to help thousands of Californians, the proposed program has been a contentious issue. Opponents say those who reject treatment may be placed into conservatorships based on the bill's text. For the care court, the worst case outcome is a conservatorship, whereas in the collaborative courts, you may end up being back in the criminal justice system. The bill received support and opposition from different organizations at the hearing. Meanwhile, Senator Maria Durazo expressed concern over how a participant might be put into a conservatorship or not. We don't understand exactly how everything is going to really work out. We're asked to take a leap of faith here. Uh, we're asked to um, make a decision that might violate what we always believe in, right? The freedoms uh, and the civil liberties that we all believe in. In the end, the committee voted unanimously to move SB 1338 forward. The following day, the Senate Health Committee also voted to pass the bill. SB 1338 is now headed to the Committee on Appropriations. The Attorney General on Thursday also announced an investigation into the fossil fuel and plastics industry. He accuses it for deceiving the public for decades. The truth is, the vast majority of plastic cannot be recycled. The truth is, the recycling rate has never surpassed 9%. According to Bonta's office, worldwide plastic production has skyrocketed to 300 million tons annually, up from 1.5 million tons in 1950. He alleges that industry executives are aware of the low recyclability rate of plastic. As part of the investigation, Bonta also issued a subpoena to ExxonMobil seeking information, saying that large oil gas company is a major source of global plastics pollution. He states that this is the first of its kind investigation and they will examine the industry's role in plastic pollution and what laws, if any, have been broken. Another part of the state is bringing masks back. One Bay Area Transit Agency voted unanimously to reinstate the mask mandate. What is being proposed is temporary. The intention is not to have a permanent mask requirement on BART. On Thursday, Bay Area Rapid Transit, or BART, voted 7-0 to, to require masks on its trains through at least the July 18th. This comes after a federal district court judge struck down the CDC's mask requirement for public transit and airplanes about a week ago. Passengers will need to keep the mask on in all portions of stations beyond fare gates. Those exempt from the requirement are children to and under, and those with medical conditions. Those who fail to comply will be fined $75. A new exhibit gives a rare and educational look into the life and mind of a global martial arts icon, Bruce Lee. It's currently on display at the Chinese Historical Society of America in San Francisco just two blocks from where Lee was born. Bruce Lee, a man of many talents and achievements, is being honored in a new exhibit showcasing his life and legacy. The exhibit just opened this week in the place where Lee was born in San Francisco's Chinatown. So he said, which is really Justin Hoover, the executive director for the Chinese Historical Society of America, says the display is to show Lee as more than just an actor and martial artist. It's designed around four core concepts, Bruce Lee as the thinker, the visionary, an athlete, and as a unifier. We all know Bruce Lee as a silver star screen, a uh, kung fu master, you know, but you don't always think of him as a business innovator. You don't always think of him as a philosopher. You don't always think of him as an artist, but he is these things and we have the documents to prove it. The exhibit has a plethora of rare memorabilia and items from Lee's personal life, like this weight bench. There's also a space in the back with an immersive multimedia experience. And I was impressed to see how much he put into not just studying the martial arts, but also philosophy. Hoover also said that the exhibit wants to show how Bruce Lee broke a lot of barriers. You know, he pioneered a lot. It was in cinema, it was in business, um, even in athletics, you know, people see him often as a martial artist, but they don't realize that he was a champion winning cha-cha-cha dancer, he was a fencer, 
He was a weightlifter. He was one of the first martial artists to adopt Western boxing techniques. He looked up to Joe Lewis and he looked up to Muhammad Ali, you know. The show is being featured at the Chinese Historical Society of America Museum. Both the museum and the exhibit creators hope the show will help revitalize the Chinatown neighborhood in San Francisco after experiencing a harsh two years due to pandemic lockdowns. Jason Blair, NTD News, San Francisco. Now let's check in with NTD's Thomas Christian for an update on sports. I'm Thomas Christian, giving you the California Today Sports Roundup. Stephen Curry put the finishing touches on an incredible five-game series by coming up with 30 points on efficient shooting, giving Golden State a four-games-to-one series victory over the Denver Nuggets. It didn't come easy, as five Nuggets players scored in double digits, and the Nuggets led 84-83, with just seven minutes and 45 seconds remaining in the fourth quarter. Back-to-back-to-back three-pointers by Curry and clutch shot-making by his supporting cast helped fuel this team to their first playoff victory since 2019. Jordan Poole struggled early coming out of the break, shooting only 3-for-10 from the field for 8 points. That made coach Steve Kerr elect to go with Gary Payton the second down the final minutes of the game, and he scored 5 important points to keep the Warriors ahead late. Peyton ended with 15 points on 6 of 8 shooting, and Klay Thompson also scored 15 in the win. Nikola Jokic scored 30 to go along with 19 rebounds and 8 assists, but also had 6 turnovers. Aaron Gordon had 15, Will Barton and Monty Morris each grabbed 14, and DeMarcus Cousins came off the bench for a vintage cool 19 points, looking like his old self. The Nuggets fought hard in this series, but were ultimately outmatched by the Warriors' superior talent. Golden State is the first team in the Western Conference to advance to the second round. They will be looking forward to a few days of rest before playing the winner of the series between the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Memphis Grizzlies. Nuggets 98, Warriors 102. The first round of the NFL Draft kicks off today. You might not have heard about it though, with eight of the NFL's teams having traded most of this year's picks and another six teams having multiple first round selections. This year's NFL Draft has the chance to be unlike any other in recent years, with a possible long wait before any of the players who throw, catch, or run with the ball come off the board. With no surefire quarterback prospects in the draft and several good but not elite receiving prospects, the offensive linemen and defensive players should dominate the early picks, with the top skill position player being Ohio State receiver Garrett Wilson, projected to go at number 10. There has never been a draft that didn't have a quarterback, receiver, running back, or tight end taken in the top 10 picks in the history of the NFL, with a player from those positions going in the top five in all but one of the past 24 drafts. The betting odds have Georgia defensive end Trayvon Walker and Michigan defensive end Aiden Hutchinson as the favorites to be taken number one overall by Jacksonville. That would mark the 12th time a defensive end was taken first in the common draft era starting in 1967, second only to the 26 quarterbacks. As always, I'm Thomas Christian, and thanks for tuning in. And that's all for tonight. You can join us again on California Today every weekday at 8.30 p.m. If you have any news tips or ideas for our show, or you just want to let us know how we're doing, our email is california.today at ntd.com. I'm Liang Zhang. Have a wonderful evening.